Hi, everyone. So the question I'm gonna ask is, can we understand perpetrators of genocide? A gulf seems to separate us here and now from their actions then and there. Their actions are so extreme and so devastating that they've gotten otherworldly quality. And perhaps we should view them as otherworldly creatures, aberrations, morally scarred, or biologically susceptible to extreme violence. Can we understand? I believe that we can, or rather, we can begin to think through the problem of perpetrators in an innovative ways that offer at least a little more insight, a little more understanding. Considerable scholarly effort has already been put into these questions, but much more is needed. To understand, we need to consider per perpetrators comparatively across instances of mass violence and genocide, but also across disciplines and levels of analysis. This is why I'd like to thank Yitzhak Fried, Alain Bertoz, and Gretti Merdal, and the Institute for Advanced Studies for organizing these conferences. Although I question the preeminence of biological explanations, I welcome these efforts and consider them helpful for reflection and debate. The problem of genocide, like the myriad human problems that we face, requires concerted inquiry across levels of analysis. My scholarly work is associated with developing a narrative perspective in psychology, and in particular, what can be thought of as a narrative hermeneutics. Admittedly, it's a little strange to suggest the utility of a hermeneutic reading to perpetrators, implying an empathic understanding of the person. But however clumsy, hermeneutics is the right word. Plainly and simply put, hermeneutics can be called interpretation theory. And there's much to be gained from listening to perpetrators and critically analyzing their accounts. Narrative psychology argues that through listening to others, we gain insight into the dynamic processes of human meaning making, how and why persons come to understand themselves, others, and the world. Narrating experience to oneself and others is an interpretive action, a tentative move to make sense, but the process is anything but linear. It's characterized by movement, fits and starts, making and remaking interpretations of life and our place in life. As imperfect as they are, interpretive actions serve as proximate attempts to make sense of experience. And narrative psychologists, for narrative psychologists, they become the objects of analysis. But researchers are also a part of this hermeneutic process. We are always one step removed, layering our insights over those of the persons we study. In other words, we're always interpreting interpretations, what Hannah Maratoya has called the double hermeneutic. Narrative psychology is the science of interpreting interpretive actions, describing them, contextualizing them, and theorizing about their meaning. Although perpetually uncertain, the project of interpretation is not a hopeless endeavor, feckless, or somehow haphazard. It begins with questions, opening up the data for reflective analysis, and ends with a concrete research article that's grounded in the data itself. As a starting point, I give a close reading to Gita Sereni's classic study, Into That Darkness, an Examination of Conscience, as an Object for Analysis. And Sereni's account of Franz Stengel's participation in the murder of disabled and Jews. Based on over 70 hours of interviews with Stengel, interviews with his wife, family members, and many others, Stengel's actions and reflections are the center of Sereni's investigation. But Sereni also contextualizes Stengel in his life and his social relationships. Following Sereni, I attempt to understand Stengel's participation in the Shoah and his reflections on his actions. How does Stengel interpret himself? How does Stengel explain his choices and motivations? What is the influence of social actors and social forces how does he understand his own agency, free will, and guilt? But I also question some of Sereni's assumptions about moral action and try to present a way of thinking through agency and action from a broader contextual perspective. It's important to begin by describing two attitudes toward interpretation. 
what Paul Ricoeur has called faith or faithfulness and suspicion. On the one hand, in faithfulness, the interpreter is concerned with fidelity to the text as an object of study. Paying close attention to their prejudices, researchers extend and elaborate the other's understanding of themselves and the world. On the other hand, suspicion interrogates the text in order to reveal the deeper and often hidden meanings. Suspicion privileges the interpreter's analytic framework as somehow more trustworthy in reaching a more profound level of truth. Recur counts Freud, but also Nietzsche and Marx as some of the most skilled practitioners of such a suspicious perspective. I would also add Sereni. Sereni doesn't ignore Stengel's interpretations, but she seeks to get past the superficial to, quote, penetrate the personality in order to find out why Stengel really became part of the murder process and his true feelings about his involvement. She wants to get to the authentic Stengel, to his conscience. I have some misgivings about the authority of such a suspicious approach to make objective moral judgments. And ultimately, I'll give an alternative reading that's more faithful and contextual. In the very first pages of the text, Sereni in introduces us to a Dusseldorf prison on Friday morning, April 2nd, 1971, and Franz Stengel, a quiet, courteous man who was convicted to life imprisonment for his co-responsibility in the murder of 900,000 people during his tenure as the Commandant of Treblinka. The man she encounters is focused on rebutting the arguments of his trial. To Sereni's ears, the arguments seem gratingly familiar. He has done nothing wrong. There had always been others above him. He had never done anything but obey orders. He had never hurt a single human being. Sereni listens carefully, but just before lunch, she intervenes and reframes the conversation to follow. I thought that I had better explain what I really wanted. I wanted him to really talk to me, tell me not what he did or did not do, but what he loved and what he hated and what he felt about the things in his life which had brought him to where he was sitting now. Perhaps we could find some truth together, some new truth which would contribute to the understanding of things that had never yet been understood. The passage is pivotal in setting the boundaries of Stengel's interpretations. Sereni isn't interested in Stengel's prepackaged justifications, but rather to get beyond them and deeper to find some truth together, an understanding which has never been understood. Clearly, we're dealing with a hermeneutics of suspicion. However, although Sereni's interviews unearth numerous details behind Stengel's initial statements, they do not essentially contradict his blanket justifications that eschew a sense of responsibility. After lunch, Stengel returns to the interview. He responds, I've thought about what you said. I want to do it. I want to try and do it. And Stengel begins telling his life. We learn that Stengel was born in a small town in Austria in 1908, that his father beat him bloodily, that he left school at age 15 in order to become a weaver, and at 23, attracted by the young policemen in the streets who looked so healthy, so secure, Stengel became a police officer. In 1934, he was, he, Stengel was awarded a service medal for finding a Nazi cache of weapons and was sent to detective training school. Stengel says this was the first step to catastrophe. In 1938, after the Anschluss, Stengel felt threatened by the news of arrests. A police officer warned him to get rid of the records of his service medal. To cover his tracks, Stengel flushes the police cards down the toilet. According to Stengel, one of his friends arranges to have him listed as an illegal Nazi party member. Stengel claimed that this was a fabrication so that he wouldn't be transported to a concentration camp. Whether or not Stengel was a Nazi party member before 1938 is not clear. But what is clear is a consistent pattern of justifications and rationalizations that position Stengel as a non-actor, simply reacting out of fear of reprisal against his family or himself. 
He presents himself as buffeted by cruel and spiteful others, as having no real choice other than become more and more deeply imbricated, first in the Nazi party, then the euthanasia program, and eventually the extermination centers. The steps are incremental ones, but each step carries significant momentum, allowing for the next. The path from policeman to commandant of Treblinka is slow, motivated by fear and ambition, and supported by the social world. At each step, Sereni tries to probe the workings of Stengel's conscience. When the first attacks on Jews occur, Stengel was advised to keep my mouth shut. Sereni asks, didn't that sound sufficiently ominous to you to indicate that this was the moment to get out? Stengel answers, but you see, it wasn't ominous then, and it wasn't a question of getting out. If it had only been as simple as that, by this time, we heard that every day of this one and that one being arrested, sent to a concentration camp, shot. It wasn't a matter of choosing to stay or not stay in our profession. What had become so quickly was a question of survival. Stengel's fear for his physical survival is his central explanation. Describing the Nazis' brutalization of an Austrian police chief Stengel says, I hate the Germans for what they pulled me into. I should have killed myself in 1938. And that's when it started for me. I must acknowledge my guilt. Stengel's admission is vague. It is they who pulled rather than Stengel who acted, and we wonder who is guilty for what. Sereni feels that he wanted and needed to say, I am guilty, but could not pronounce the words when speaking of the murder of hundreds of thousands. As she says, except for a monster who actually participated in such events, can concede guilt and yet consent to remain alive. The words are critical in the structure of Sereni's book. Two admissions of guilt frame the book, one at the very beginning and the second during their last interview, just before Stengel's death. A second clear motive, unstated by Stengel, is his desire for advancement in his career. Stengel's wife remarks on his ambitiousness during the war. Stengel's sister-in-law also comments on his desire for social advancement, but attributes it to both Stengel and his wife. In one instance, Stengel's ambition is apparent in his actions. When the security branch of the Austrian police is integrated into the Gestapo, Stengel requested a different title. He didn't believe that his new title was equivalent to his old one. Stengel protests and is given a promotion. The request might appear minor, but it is likely that Stengel's ambition was noticed by Nazi officials, another step. For the promotion, he signs a paper giving up his affiliation with the Catholic Church, yet another step. Stengel is given a second promotion in order to report to Tiergartenstrasse 4 in Berlin. He didn't know it at the time, but T4 was the headquarters for the Nazi euthanasia of the mentally and physically disabled. Stengel is briefed on the Nazi ra rationale behind mercy killings. He is told that it is a totally painless death, a real release from what was an intolerable life, and that he would have nothing what ever, whatever to do with the actual operation. I was merely responsible for law and order. Stengel says he was pressured into the job. The alternative would leave him at the whims of a hated police chief, once again, he had no real choice. Stengel was not immune to the dilemma of euthanasia. He says that he was emotionally and physically affected by working there. He recounts discussing the ethics with his close friend. On some level, he feels that it's wrong, but he keeps himself occupied with the task of keeping order, concealing the murderous purposes of the center, and filling out death certificates to make sure that the process was, quote, being done correctly. Stengel's rationalizations serve to separate his career, which he views as police work, from the killings, which his activities aid and abet. As he claims, he never murdered anyone with his own hands, but was merely ensuring law and order, making sure that the facility functioned properly. But he gives additional rationalizations. Stengel recounts a story of visiting a nun who points to a small child in a basket and asks Stengel to guess his age. Although the child is, was 16, he looks like he's five. 
The nun says that he was rejected by the medical commission for the euthanasia program. How could they not accept him, she said, no good to himself or anyone else? How could they refuse to deliver him from this miserable life? Stengel adds, who was I then to doubt what was being done? Although he signed away his allegiance to the Catholic Church, he was still clearly influenced by the incident, which gave a blessing to the program. When the church publicly protests, the program is suddenly stopped. But the knowledge and personnel from T4 is harnessed for the larger project of mass extermination in the death camps in Poland, a point that I'll return to later. And in 1942, Stengel is ordered to report to Odilo Lobosnik in Lublin, and then to Sobibor. Stengel says that he didn't know the true purpose of the camp that he helped to build at Sobibor. Sereni questions his story as at least partly fabrication, partly rationalization, and partly evasion. His friend discovers a funny building in the woods that looked exactly like the gas chamber at Schloss Hartham from T4. Stengel goes back to see Globosnik, who orders him to report to Belzik. And Stengel tells two versions of the trip to Belzik, his disgust at the scent and sight of piles of corpses, and his understanding of the murderous intentions of the camps. Sereni writes, this was the real moment of decision for him, the time when he might have braved what he, what he certainly considered the deadly dangers of taking the stand and didn't because it wasn't in him to do so. Once again, he continues with his work, out of fear for himself and his family. Indeed, as Sereni asks, can any man or his deeds be understood in isolation of his childhood, his youth and manhood, from the people who loved him or didn't love him, and from the people he loved or needed? Stengel's wife was his most immediate and essential other. He met his wife as a young police officer and stayed with her during the war in Syria and then in Brazil and to his death. Although Frau Stengel did not know that her husband was involved in the euthanasia program. She did, does find out about his work at the Sobibor death camp during a vis family visit there. She confronts Stengel in a rage of tears as she recounts, I said, how can you be there and have nothing to do with it? But she allows herself to be comforted with his words. My work is purely administrative and I'm there to build, that's all. I don't do anything to anybody. Frau Stengel continues, of course I didn't know that he was the commandant. I never knew that. He said he was in charge of construction and that he enjoyed the work. I thought, my God. One of the most intense interactions comes near, near the end of the book, when Sereni asks Frau Stengel if forcing him to choose between his family and killing would have stopped him. Frau Stengel retires to the bedroom for over an hour. She returns to the interview, composed, but she's obviously been crying. She says, he would, in the final analysis, have chosen me. Sereni writes, I felt strongly that this was the truth. If she had commanded the courage and moral conviction to force him, she would have saved him. But the next morning, Sereni receives a handwritten note that ambiguously contradicts her previous statement. This is not so, because as I know him so well, he would never have destroyed himself or the family. And this is what I learned to understand. Stengel also comes back to the subject of, of guilt in his final interview. Once again, he distinguishes his actions with his own hands from the genocide. My conscience is clear about what I did myself. I have never intentionally hurt anyone myself. But he does begin to vaguely admit responsibility for the larger project that his actions supported. But I was there. In reality, I share the guilt. Only in these talks, now I have talked about it for the first time. He continues, I should have died. That was my guilt. Sereni probes, do you mean that you should have died or you should have had the courage to die? But it is unclear if Stengel understands the question. And Stengel dies of heart failure just 19 hours later. Stengel does carefully express shared guilt about being part of the genocidal mach machinery. I was there. But being guilty that he should have died or have the courage to die is hardly an inclusive sense of guilt. Perhaps Stengel is saying that he should have opted out of his role 
through the only path that he saw available to him, his death. But this is much different from a sense of personal guilt or responsibility in the project of mass murder. Still, Sereni's epilogue emphasizes responsibility. As she writes, social morality is contingent upon the individual's capacity to make responsible decisions, to make the fundamental choice between right and wrong. This capacity de derives from this mysterious core, the very essence of the human person. At best, Stengel seems to be operating at what Lawrence Kohlberg might call, characterize as stage three or stage four moral reasoning, the conventional level. He participated in acts of murder because that's what was expected of him, oftentimes citing imagined or real fears of retribution. Still, he's unable to think past the social conventions of his time. From our vantage point in the present, and Sereni's in the 1970s, it is unsettling that Stengel never questions the morality of the Nazis' murderous deeds. Was his participation, as, as Sereni argues, a problem of individual moral conscience? Shouldn't Stengel feel a sense of responsibility in the then and there of the 1970s? Such an expectation requires the imposition of a particular moral discourse. Serenia is operating from a perspective that requires individual agency and responsibility, choice and free will. This appears logical because this is the pervasive discourse that we in the contemporary West use to understand ourselves and explain our actions. Although Sereni's interpretation is nuanced and contextual, she retains these assumptions about freedom and individual responsibility. In a cultural analysis of moral explanations, Schwader, Much, Mahapatra, and Park argue that there are three clusters or realms of moral discourse, autonomy, community, and divinity. The ethics of autonomy relies on regulative concepts such as harms, rights, and justice, aims to protect the zone of discretionary choice of individuals, and to promote the exercise of free will in the pursuit of personal preference. The ethics of community relies on the regulative concepts of duty, hierarchy, interdependency, and souls aims to protect the moral integrity of the various stations or roles that constitute a society or a community. The ethics of divinity relies on regulatory concepts such as sacred order, natural order, tradition, sin, pollution, aims to protect the soul and the spirit from degradation. For Schwader, these ethics coexist and are found across cultures. But different cultures, and we might suppose different historical epics, have preferred ethics. Like other perpetrators, Stengel appears mainly, appeals mainly to an ethics of community, duty, and hierarchy to explain his actions. Obviously, in the 1930s and 40s, the ethics of divinity, including notions of sacredness, the natural order, purity, and pollution is omnipresent the destiny of the Aryan master race, Jews as race defilers or vermin. In the 1970s, as now, referencing divinity as an explanation for the Shoah would be acutely offensive. It's jarring that Stengel merely gestures to such an effect when he says, perhaps the Jews were meant to have this enormous jolt to pull them together to create a people by this, Stengel did indeed mean through God's divine intervention. Also remember his rationalization of euthanasia with the nun's blessing. Sereni attempts to position Stengel as a moral actor within an ethics of autonomy. In the 1970s, Stengel accepts these terms but delimits the ethics of autonomy, adamantly insisting that he never killed anyone with his own hands and that for what he did with his own free will, he accepts responsibility. But his rationalizations for his actions are, for his actions are mainly within an ethics of community. And his larger rationale for the genocide are within an ethics of divinity. Stengel seems to be caught between explanatory 
discourses, those preferred in the 1930s and 40s and the 1970s. Although he recounts discussing the euthanasia program, he does not question the decision of those higher up. He respects or fears hierarchy and considers it his duty to implement orders. As a police officer, the notion of duty is even more salient. As unsettling or as uncomfortable as it may be, at the very least, Stengel rationalizes his actions as unproblematic. He doesn't say full-throated, good, as in morally correct, but there are some hints in such direction, and certainly others within the hierarchy believe so. Did Stengel feel that his actions were wrong? There is ample evidence that on some basic emotional level, many perpetrators suffered emotional consequences. But, as Haight and Joseph argue, there is a difference between a quick, intuitive, and emotional flash and the explanations that we give for these moral impulses. At numerous moments, Stengel notes his disgust at the filth, sights, and smells of mass murder. After the war in Brazil, he observes that the cows before their slaughter had the same trusting look in their eyes as Jews, and Stengel stops eating canned meat. At a basic intuitive level, Stengel seems to feel that it was wrong in his bones. And it is here that proposals to understand the underlying biological substrates of routine killers would seem to have the most traction. Sereni provides an extensive reflection on whether or not Stengel was specially chosen to work in the death camps. She states that she is convinced that the 96 men selected for work in the extermination centers were, caref were chosen very carefully from the ranks of the original 400 T4 personnel for specific qualities observed during their apprenticeship in the euthanasia program. She notes the disproportionate number of Austrians, like Stengel, who were psychologically made to feel more dependent, more vulnerable to pressure. Certainly, Stengel's story is a testament to fear and vulnerability, but also, as the E syndrome posits experientially, the ability to compartmentalize and rationalize his effective reactions to carry on with his job. Perhaps this was noticed too. In spite of the flashes of moral intuition that the project of killing innocent people is wrong, or at least disgusting, and the moral dialogue that Stengel is engaged in with himself and others, he is able to manage these conflicts and emotions and continue even to enjoy his work. That there would be a corresponding brain state for this mind state is no surprise. It's untenable to hold that the mind is somehow working independently of the brain. But perhaps too obvious to say, there are multiple problems in moving between what we know about the brain and what we know about human action. Despite some provocative experiments, direction of influence remains a question. Although one might view the material of the brain as somehow more hard and determinative than the soft reality of so psychological and social life, brains are inseparable from and always contextualized in the lives of persons and their social and cultural world. Their influences are highly interactive, emergent, dialogic, and abundantly complex. So what are the most productive levels of analysis to tackle the problem of perpetrators? Certainly, multiple levels of analysis and approaches are needed. Would understanding brain states help? Perhaps yes. Adding more complexity to such difficult questions could be insightful. But it's impossible to split off the brain from the context of the life of the person and how they interpret the world, or from the social relationships and cultural systems of meaning in which persons are always deeply imbricated. The formulation, the brains that pull the triggers is provocative, but is it true? Do brains pull triggers? In my eyes, there's a large conceptual distance in need of description and explication between a brain state and an action, especially actions that evolve over years, like Stengel's. Here I'm pushing my limits, as Yitzchak requested, but I have a strong sense that brains are not identical to the contextualized person. Brains are both more than and less than persons, persons who have relationships, desires, anxieties, goals, struggles, dreams, and agency, who come to understand themselves as a particular person with a past, present, and future, a person who has an identity, 
a life grounded in time and place, in a world always and already filled with meaning. Brain science may provide some clues into the dynamics between these psychological and social processes in the brain, but ultimately, brains can't be extracted from context. If anything, we need to think of brains as fully integrated into the experience of being a human, especially the fundamental human capacity to make our actions and lives sensible to ourselves and others. As I've argued, the key to understanding others is to closely listen to how they interpret themselves and their world. The key to understanding perpetrators is to critically investigate them on their own terms, in their own language, to decenter ourselves, to see their logic, to understand their life and world. These contextual factors are necessary to understanding the hows and whys persons become killers, but also perhaps sufficient. It is possible to understand Stengel's descent into darkness. At every step of the way, his interpretations matter. Stengel became the kind of killer that he did for reasons particular to his life, his choice of career, his ambition, his vulnerability, and, and real or imagined fears. His descent was supported by social relationships, their commissions and omissions for what they said and did and di didn't say or do. But his descent was also buttressed and interpreted through historical and cultural systems of meaning, ethical codes, which helped him to drown out his revulsion, understand his responsibility as limited, and believe in a greater good. Thank you. <laughs>